In this video, we're going to derive an extremely important relationship between Ka for an acid and Kb for the conjugate base of that acid. This relationship is important not just because it's quantitative, and it is, it allows us to go between Ka and Kb for a conjugate pair, but also because it has very important qualitative implications about acid and base strength, in that if we know in a qualitative sense whether an acid is strong, for example, we can predict whether the conjugate base will be strong or weak. To develop this relationship, let's consider the weak base in H3. In blue here, we have the base association equilibrium for NH3 as a base, and we can tell it's a base association equilibrium because hydroxide appears here. The equilibrium constant for this process is Kb for NH3 by definition, right? If we look at the chemical equation below, we have the conjugate base of NH3, that's NH4+, reacting with water to generate NH3 itself and H3O+, hydronium ion, and because this reaction involves the generation of hydronium through a reaction with water, the equilibrium constant for this reaction is Ka for NH4+, that's by definition. Let's write expressions for each of these. The Kb for NH3 is equal to products over reactants, as usual, nothing terribly out of the ordinary there. We have the concentration of NH4+, at equilibrium and the concentration of hydroxide at equilibrium in the numerator. And in the denominator, we have the concentration of NH3 aqueous, and water is left out because it's a pure liquid. For Ka, for the conjugate acid, NH4+, we apply a similar idea, just write in equilibrium expressions as we've done many times at this point, 12-12K. We have NH3, and hydronium concentrations in the numerator. And in the denominator, we have the concentration of the conjugate acid, NH4+, and again, water is left out because it's a pure liquid. Notice something interesting here. In the Kb expression in blue, we have the NH4 plus concentration in the numerator and the NH3 concentration in the denominator. But in the Ka expression for the conjugate acid, we have NH3 in the numerator and NH4 plus in the denominator, right? That means that when we multiply the two, when we multiply Ka for NH4 plus times Kb for the conjugate base, NH3, those two sets of terms are going to divide out. NH4 plus in the numerator of the Kb expression is going to divide out with NH4 plus in the denominator of the Ka expression, and NH3 in the numerator of the Ka expression is going to divide out with NH3 in the denominator of the Kb expression. All that's to say is that the terms that are associated with the acid and the conjugate base are going to disappear when we multiply these two things together. And all we're going to be left with is the hydronium concentration term from the Ka expression and the hydroxide ion term from the Kb expression. But this equilibrium expression involving only hydronium and hydroxide concentrations should look very familiar. This is the equilibrium expression for the self-ionization of water. And just to show that really quickly, to help us recall the self-ionization of water. The chemical equation here is two water molecules in liquid form forming hydronium and hydroxide, both aqueous, both species aqueous over here. And so the equilibrium expression for this reaction is indeed concentration of H3O plus at equilibrium times the concentration of hydroxide at equilibrium, and that's equal to Kw. So this is pretty neat. We've shown, at least for this example, that the product of Ka for an acid and Kb for the conjugate base, which here I'll write as Ha and A minus, but we derived it for a positive acid and a neutral conjugate base. It's equally valid in both cases, is equal to Kw, which at 25 degrees C is equal to 10 to the negative 14. This means that given a Ka, we can go to Kb for the conjugate base, given a Kb, we can go to Ka for the conjugate acid. Ka's and Kb's tend to have exponents in them and be very tiny values in general, so don't forget about the p-function. We can apply the p-function to that relationship from the last slide to arrive at pKa plus pKb equals pKw, which is going to be equal to 14 
at 25 degrees C only. And finally, one last remark about this relationship is that it applies only to conjugate acid base pairs. Only applies to pairs like HA and A minus or HA plus and neutral A. Only these pairs that differ by a single proton. For any other pair, if we do this Ka, Kb multiplication, then the terms that depend on the acid and base won't divide out when we multiply the two together. So we have to be dealing with conjugate acid base pairs for this to work. So we've seen the quantitative utility of this equation in that we can go from a Ka to a Kb for the conjugate or vice versa, right? But the qualitative implications of this relationship are arguably even more important. Um, this notion that as pKa goes up, pKb must go down, and vice versa, right? So since Kw is what it is, independent of the conjugate pair we're looking at, right? As the Ka increases, the Kb must decrease. Qualitatively, this means that the stronger the acid, in other words, the larger the Ka value, the weaker the conjugate base. And of course, the opposite is also true. The stronger is the base, in other words, the larger is the Kb, the weaker the conjugate acid, meaning the smaller is the Ka. To give you a couple of extreme examples of these effects in action, consider HCl and Cl- and CH4 and CH3-. HCl is a classic example of a strong acid. It's on our list of strong acids that dissociate completely. Cl- is actually a classic example of an extremely weak base. Because HCl is such a strong acid, and thanks to the magic of this relationship, we know that the Kb for Cl- is extremely tiny, and thus Cl- is a very weak base. On the other hand, CH4 is very weak as an acid. Its Ka value is extremely, extremely small. However, CH3- is an extremely strong base. This is the conjugate base of CH4, and it's an extremely strong base because its conjugate acid is very weak. And again, thanks to this relationship, for a very, very small Ka value, we can immediately conclude that the Kb value for the conjugate base must be very large. This table highlights this effect and gives us a list of acids from strong to weak and bases from weak to strong. So at the top of the list, we have the example we just looked at, HCl, very strong acid. Its conjugate base, very weak, essentially negligible basicity. And you're going to notice ions over here on the very, very weak side of the basic scale that are notorious for not reacting and just kind of dissolving in water and hanging around, like Cl minus, HSO4 minus, nitrate, sulfate, all that good stuff. On the other end of the scale, we have acids that are extremely weak. So CH4 is here at the bottom of the scale. One other acid, quote unquote, that's worth noting is hydroxide, right? Hydroxide contains a hydrogen that in theory could be lost as a proton, giving O2 minus. However, that is an extremely unfavorable process with a very, very tiny Ka value. And so O2 minus, the conjugate base of hydroxide, is actually a very strong base. And these bases down here are notorious for being great at deprotonating pretty much anything. O2 minus, hydride H minus, and the methyl anion are three of the strongest bases we'll see. It's really important at this point to develop an intuitive feel for the relationship between the strengths of an acid and its conjugate base, or a base and its conjugate acid. Realize that once you appreciate the strength of an acid, let's say, you also know the strength of the conjugate base. So on the list of strong acids, for example, that is worth putting on your crib sheet, from that list of strong acids, using the ideas in this video, you immediately know that the conjugate bases of those acids are extremely weak. This idea makes it easy to draw conclusions about acid or base strength without necessarily going to look up Ka's and Kb's at every turn. If you know something about the conjugate, you can draw conclusions about an acid or a base.